This is the pre-lab talk for experiment number five, determining the pKa of an acid-base indicator. The goal for this experiment is to use Beer's law along with absorption spectroscopy to determine the pKa or pKin for bromothymol blue, a common acid-base indicator. There are a couple of new or revisited techniques for this experiment. The biggest one is that we're going to use the SpectroViz Plus and the LoggerPro software to collect an abs absorption spectra for several solutions. We're also going to use a pH sensor to measure the pH of the solution. We're not going to focus too much on the mechanics of using the, of using the sensor until um, we do the lab on acids and bases, but we need to use this as a tool to help us perform our calculation. We're also going to use a pipette and pipette bulb for this experiment, which we'll review how to use during the lab itself. In today's safety pause, we're going to look at the hazards for this experiment. The major hazard for this experiment is the use of one molar HCl and NaOH. At, the, these at this concentration, these chemicals are mildly corrosive, and gloves should be worn with, along with the standard PPE of lab goggles and a, safe, and a lab coat. We will also make sure that acids and bases, or acids, are neutralized before flushing them down the drain. Low pH solutions can cause environmental, environmental damage, as well as damage to the plumbing in the building. Typically, there is a lab that comes before this one that, that helps you to understand why we see colors the way that we do see colors and what contributes to the colors of a solution. Since we're not doing this, that lab this summer, it's a good idea to go over these things so that you understand why we're using spectroscopy here. We, let's review a few things that you might know from Gen Chem 1. In Gen Chem 1, you probably talked about light and how it interacts with matter, and that atoms absorb light and emit light as electrons make transitions between energy levels in atoms. The same thing happens in molecules as well. You might have also learned that there are different types of light, ranging from very short wavelength, high energy light, such as gamma radiation, to long wavelength light that has lower energy, such as radio waves. You might have also realized that the visible spectrum is a narrow band of wavelengths that we can detect with our eyes, somewhere between 400 and about 750 nanometers as, a, as in wavelength. Spectroscopy is a very important field, of, field in chemistry where we study that interaction between light and matter. Different wavelengths of light can be used to look at different things about molecules. It can give us different pieces of information. For example, of course we know that we can use x-rays to look at internal structures in the body such as as your skeletal system. But you might not what you might not realize is that we use x-rays to also determine the crystal structure of different molecules. We use radio waves to detect nuclear transitions, which is taken advantage of in, when, you take an, when you have an MRI done in the, in the hospital. In chem, when you go on to take organic chemistry, you'll also use radio waves in the form of NMR, which is basically the same thing as MRIs, except we're doing the MRI on a, mol a molecular sample to determine, the sh to determine the structure of an organic molecule a very important characterizing technique. We're going to look at 
some UV vis spectroscopy. Where we look at visible light and some light in the UV and some light also in the near infrared. These wavelengths of light are very useful in looking at molecular energy levels. We're going to, however, we're going to do something a little bit simpler. We're going to use this to help us determine an, an equilibrium constant. To do this, we're going to have to take a, a spectrum. Most spectrometers work in very similar ways. So here's a little bit of a schematic to explain how the SpectroVis Plus spectrometer works. In the SpectroVis Plus and in all spectrometers is a light source, some sort of source that gives off all the wavelengths of light we're interested in studying. For SpectroVis Plus, light is given off in a little bit of the ultraviolet to the near infrared, wavelengths that are slightly longer than the visible red light. This light passes through your sample holder or cuvette. This time we're here we're going to look at a sample that's my favorite color, pink. If you take the indicator phenolphthalein and put it in basic solution or solution of NaOH, it turns a nice magenta pink color, one of my favorite colors in chemistry. Now, some wavelengths of light are going to pass straight through that solution, namely red, blue, and violet light. The other wavelengths of light are absorbed by the solution. The wavelengths of light that are transmitted by the solution or go through the solution end up going to a detector. There are many different types of de detectors used in, in spectrometers, but for the SpectraVis Plus, the, detec the detector is, has what we call diffraction grating, or a piece of glass that has small ridges on it that helps to bend the different wavelengths of light so that they're detected by an array of diodes. The detector then sends the information to the LoggerPro software for the computer. And the LoggerPro software prints out a spectrum. Here's a simple spectrum that you might see for this solution. In this spectrum, we plot the absorbance, which is related to the light transmitted versus wavelength in nanometers. As I said, absorbance is related to light transmitted. There's sort of an inverse relationship. So the peak on the spectrum represents the light that was absorbed by the solution. So you can see that the solution absorbs light that's mostly in the green, greenish region, green or yellow region, around 500 nanometers, 500 to 600 between 500 and 600 nanometers. We can see that red light, blue light, and violet light was transmitted by the solution, as seen in the schematic. If you look at the spectrum itself, we can see that at those wavelengths near 400 to 450 nanometers, and at about 700 nanometers, the absorbance is low, meaning that that light was transmitted. So low, low absorbance means high transmission of light, and high absorbance, so low absorbance means high transmission of light, and high absorbance means low, tr low transmission of light. The color of the solution that we see is, a combina is, is basically the light that was transmitted by the solution. So red, blue, and violet come together to make the pink color that we perceive. We don't see the absorbed wavelengths of light. Now that we understand how spectro the spectrum relates to the color of the solution, let's look at another important effect that we're going to use today. There is a relationship between the concentration of our solution and the absorbance. This relationship is given by the Beer-Lambert Law, or simply Beer's Law. 
Bayer's law states that the absorption, which is given by the symbol capital A, absorbance given by the symbol capital A, is equal to epsilon times B times C. Where epsilon is the molar absorptivity that depends on the solution itself and the wavelength that you're measuring the solution at. B is the path length that the light goes through as we make our spectroscopy measurement. This is equal to the length of the huvet, which is about one centimeter for this experiment. And C is the molar concentration. According to Vera's law, we would expect that if we replace our solution with a less concentrated solution, given by the, the less intense um, color, that our absorption spectra would be less intense, or the absorbance would be lower. This is the simple relationship between the absorbance measured and our, and our concentration. This relationship is very important and has been used to, to determine many constants and other important parameters. Now let's get back to our experiment. How are we going to use this to make our measurements? Well, let's take a look at the molecule bromothymol blue. Let's not worry too much about the structure. It's pretty complicated, as you can see. However, there's something very simple to understand about an indicator. Acid-base indicators typically are themselves weak acids. There is a form of the indicator that is protonated at low pH. We'll call this form HIN. And there's also a deprotonated form of the mo molecule when the pH is higher. We call this IN minus. In the case of bromothymol blue, at the low pH, the molecule, the molecular form is yellow, appears to be yellow in solution. And at the higher pHs, the molecule is the molecule is blue in solution. In solution, there's an equilibrium established between the protonated and deprotonated forms of the molecule. This is called an, an acid ionization equilibrium that shows the proton transfer between HIN and the water molecule. The ratio between the concentration of deprotonated and protonated form gives rise to the color of the solution. When they're at about equal concentrations, then the solution appears to be a, col a color in between yellow and blue, or a combination of yellow and blue, in this case green. We can write we can write an equilibrium constant for this. We can write an equilibrium constant expression for this equation. We call this equilibrium constant KIN, or the indicator's acid ionization constant, which is equal to the H3O plus concentration times the concentration of IN minus over the concentration of HIN. In our lab manual, a derivation is present that shows that. Through the, relation, through the Beer's Law relationship, you can express this equilibrium constant in terms of the hydronium ion concentration and a ratio between some absorbances that will be measured by measure, taking three spectra. One spectrum of the green solution, where the concentrations of, of both of the protonated and deprotonated species are about equal. And then of the yellow and blue solutions, where for the yellow solution, the concentration of HIN is high, and in the blue solution, the concentration of IN minus is higher. We also need to know the H3O plus concentration, which will de determine by taking the pH of the solution. There's a relationship between the pH of the solution and the hydronium ion concentration, which we'll explore in the next slide.
But basically, that's what we're doing in this experiment. Now let's look over some procedural points that are going to be important. Most things will be explained in the video, but let's take a look at some things. There are a couple of measurements that we need to make. So this experiment really relies on keeping the concentration of bromothymol blue const constant itself. We do this by making some very careful volume measurements using a graduated pipette and, and a pipette bulb. The graduated pipette allows us to make volume measurements of high precision. We'll go over how to use the pipette and pipette bulb in, during the video. Another important thing that, that we want to mention is the mass measurements are also very important. We want to make sure we're using uh, two compounds, sodium phosphate dibasic and sodium phosphate monobasic. We're using these two compounds to make a buffer which will keep the pH around the, very close to the PK, PKIN of the, of the indicator itself. This means that at the, around that transition pH, the concentrations are roughly equal and roughly, roughly equal. And we get a green solution. So it's very important that those, those mass measurements are close together too, so that we have the best buffer possible. Another calculation that you might not have got to in lecture is looking at p-scale calculations. So if you, when you're doing p-scale calculations, you're taking the negative log of whatever the value is. So when we take the pH of a substance, for example, we are measuring the negative log of the H plus or H3O plus concentration. We'll have you practice doing a couple of those calculations in the pre-lab.